Many thanks, Petra. <laughs> And uh, many thanks to the New Generations Independent Indian Film Festival for in inviting me back. It's a great pleasure to be back six years after uh, the publication of my first book on New Independent Indian Cinema. So what I hope to achieve today is just a very small encapsulation of uh, my latest book, which is called Indian Indies, A Guide to New Independent Indian Cinema, which was released uh, earlier this year. Uh, it kind of casts a backward glance over a decade of the evolution of new independent Indian cinema. So that's what I'm going to try and kind of condense into this very short presentation. And I'm hoping that we can then have an open conversation after that. So uh, this is my trilogy of books on new independent Indian cinema. The journey started with India's new independent cinema, Rise of the Hybrid, as Petra said, uh, published in 2016. That was followed up with an edited volume, a collection of essays, very eclectic in, in form and style, broaching a diverse spectrum of themes and topics and films from new independent Indian cinema. That book was called Indian Cinema Beyond Bollywood, The New Independent Cinema Revolution. And this book, uh, which was published this year, Indian Indies, as I've said, uh, and I'm pleased to say has a foreword by Shabana Azmi, the, the legendary, iconic Indian actor. So um, it's been more or less 10 years since the Indies emerged on the scene, but I consider 2010 to be a watershed moment. This is when there were a host of films, very seminal films, that were distinctively different from Bollywood, because Bollywood has problematically been equated with the entirety of Indian cinema. So when you say the word Indian cinema, people invariably think of song and dance, Bollywood extravaganzas, kind of uh, glitz and glamour, saturated color palette. But here you have films that kind of are very left of field, push the envelope of that popular conception. For example, films like Kiran Rao's Dobi Ghat, Anusha Rizvi's Peeply Live, uh, Gandu, which is a very controversial film, uh, by the director Q, uh, the portmanteau film I Am, directed by Onir, LSD. A, there was a plethora of different films in that year, which caused me to think of this year as the real launch pad when uh, the new Indi uh, independent films started to kind of cohere together as a distinctive genre. So it's very important to bear that year in mind. I thought I'd cite some of the key characteristics of Indian independent films. What distinguishes them from Bollywood? What makes them very idiosyncratic or individual? So the Indies are global in that they combine the global and the local. So the storylines are very local. All of the films have a very rooted Indian context in terms of their themes and storylines. But they're very global in their grammar, in their film kind of form, aesthetic, the style is very much what people would call global cinemas or world cinemas. So that is one of the things to bear in mind. But these films are very bold and brash. They're often very controversial films. They're very socio-politically oriented. They're very uh, critical of the Indian government, uh, a lot of these films. I look at them as state of the nation stories. So when you compare them with, let's say, the British films of the 1980s, which were also state of the nation stories, which were interrogating the Thatcherite regime at that point in time, a lot of the new Indian Indies are doing the same thing in a way. So some examples, as I've mentioned again, Peeply Live, that's always a film I return to because I consider it to be a very foundational film uh, in terms of the Indies. But there have been a whole host of other films, you know, across the last 10 years. Uh, spanning People Live to a film like Jai, Jai Beam, which talks about uh, Dalit identity in contemporary India. A lot of these films are low budget, but a lot of them are very successful uh, at the box office. Again, People Live was a really good example. Uh, I'll cite a few more example, uh, examples of films that are very low, low budget, but then go on to do quite well at the box office. Now, these films are usually made with different sources of funding and avail of different sources of uh, forms of exhibition and distribution. And in that sense, they are very different from the, the parallel cinema of the 1970s and the 80s in India, where those fel films in, in the parallel cinema tended to be quite niche, very esoteric, largely catering to the uh, English-speaking intelligentsia, whereas these films the filmmakers want a wider audience, largely because they can generate funds to go out and make the next film. So it's a, it's a survival mechanism or strategy. 
These films are bilingual and trilingual, so they amalgamate lots of different languages. They're not, unlike Bollywood, which is pr predominantly in Hindi, uh, a lot of the Indies will combine four to five languages often. A good example being Ship of Theseus, which has languages ranging from Kannada, Marathi, Hindi, to Swedish and Arabic, so very global again. These films, a lot of them appeal to the younger demographic in urban centers across India. Uh, they're very different from the earlier Indian art house in terms of being, as I've said, financially successful. So they're not really completely art house in that sense, but it's the content and the, the storylines that you can equate with art cinema of, of the parallel uh, cinema movement. Uh, as I've said, these festivals have won a range of accolades across the world. A good example is a film called Court, which is a very low budget film that won more than 24 international awards. Lipstick Under My Burka is another good example of a film that's got a whole host of different uh, plaudits. Another key distinguishing element of the Indies in comparison with Bollywood, which often tends to objectify women and stereotype women through what's called song and dance item numbers which are, I, I would consider incredibly problematic. But in contrast, the Indies have a very strong roles for women both behind and in front of the camera. Often these films uh, consist of female directors, screenwriters, uh, actors, and so on. A good example is a film called Angry Indian Goddesses, which uh, has an ensemble of seven female uh, characters going out on a road trip. So um, also, these films are very po politically conscious. Uh, they broach themes of LGBTQI issues, religious violence, the rise of populist politics, the socioeconomic disparity that exists in India. So that is a kind of brief synopsis of what the Indies are and how you, you can identify them in general. Where can you access new independent Indian films? Very important point. So Netflix and Amazon Prime entered the Indian market in 2016, which was also a real pivotal point, a real game changer, because up to that point, there was a vacuum in terms of the lack of an independent film distribution structure in India. And films that fell within the alternative film ambit were often excluded from multiplex cinemas or standalone cinema theaters. And therefore, when these big streaming platforms came in, all of a sudden there was a, a portal that you know, filmmakers of an independent persuasion could kind of get their films up there and visible, not just to Indian, but global audiences. So that continues to be the case. But I'd also like to uh, underscore the importance of film festivals. For example, your festival here in Frankfurt, uh, Petra, is very important in uh, serving as a conduit, a kind of pathway for audiences here in Frankfurt and in Germany to kind of access films that they ordinarily may not have access to. And it's the same within India as well. There are a lot of regional, um, what's called over the top OTT streaming platforms. Uh, there are more than 30 plus if streaming platforms in India and growing in number. But film festivals play a very crucial role. They are the lifeblood, I still think, of uh, films that are made outside of the main studio system. Uh, so I'm associate director of the UK Asian Film Festival, uh, which runs across several cities in the UK, including Leicester, Edinburgh, uh, Coventry, and London. So we try our best to champion films, not just from India, but across South Asia. So films from Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, and so on. So one of the um, initiatives that the UK Asian Film Festival started during COVID when the film curation sector was facing an existential crisis was um, the South Asian Film Festival's Federation. So this was devised with a view to kind of contemplating how we could chart the future at a time when big streaming platforms were dominating, almost taking over uh, the circuits and the constellations of film access. So we had an online conference uh, including several prominent global South Asian film festivals, including um, New Generations, where Petra and Binu were presented uh, their own experience and strategies to kind of uh, tackle this COVID time. And uh, so if you're interested, you can actually watch the video recording of that um, interaction. It's on the UCAF website. So we continue that strand this year as well. The theme for UCAF this year was Dare to Dream, emerging from a COVID landscape into a post-COVID landscape. And we had another little symposium 
of uh, the South Asian Film Festival Federations, again included several of the festivals from 2021. Uh, one of the schemes we run, which I'd really like to highlight from the UK Asian Film Festival, is the, the Emerging Curators Lab, which I started in 2019 with a view to equipping film f young film uh, curators of the future. It started off as a young, film, uh, young curators lab, but we thought that was being a bit ageist, so we've now rebranded it as the Emerging Curators Lab, which is open to ed everyone over the age of 18. We also run this uh, workshop online, so it's uh, accessible to anybody who's interested in film curation as a potential career pathway, or just interested in how to curate films. So this consists of a weekend uh, masterclass, a workshop that presents the foundational skills uh, involved in good film curation practice. And then the participants get to watch three films that are shortlisted for the UK Asian Film Festival, and they choose their own winning film, which is given an award at uh, the UK Asian Film Festival. So uh, this is one of the things that we have uh, kind of really been committed to in terms of nurturing a new generation of film curators. And this year, we uh, collaborated with the Diorama Fe Film Festival, which uh, is based in New Delhi. So we had a really international pool of participants. So I'm now going to turn to some key examples of Indian Indies uh, that are, have really punctuated the 10 years of the development of this genre of Indian cinema. Uh, as I've mentioned, feminist themes and female-oriented narratives are the beating heart of the Indies, in, in my estimation. And a film that exemplifies that point is Lipstick Under My Burka. I don't know if anyone's seen this film already, but it was a fairly controversial film. It was denied a certificate of release at the time by the Central Board of Film Certification, which is commonly called the Indian Censor Board. And they deemed the film too female-oriented or too lady-oriented, to be accurate. Obviously, this was deeply problematic, but at the UK Asian Film Festival, we took the film on board, screened it across the UK, and it galvanized some really interesting Q&A discussions. So I'm just going to uh, play the trailer of the film, which gives you an idea. It's about um, four women in small-town India, all battling against patriarchy and misogyny in their own ways, kind of uh, trying to find an emancipatory articulation of their own desires, their repressed desires. So let's have a look. Okay, so the second film uh, I'd like to signpost here is Aligarh, which is a film, uh, it's based on a true life incident where a gay university professor in Aligarh uh, was outed nationally uh, on national media by a media sting operation where he was filmed having sex with a male rickshaw puller. And this led to his social ostracization. He lost his job. He was shunned by society. And the film uh, kind of tries to uh, reflect on that particular incident. It contains a powerhouse performance by the actor Manoj Bajpai, who plays the titular character Professor Siras. So this is another example of a film that was kind of enmeshed in uh, political activism, because at that point in time, there was uh, the social movement for the repeal of Article uh, Section 377 of the Indian Constitution, which outlawed, uh, outlawed rather, uh, homosexuality, and eventually in 2018, uh, that law was then abrogated, struck down. So in a way, film has, independent films like Aligar have contributed to that discourse of uh, kind of interrogating some of these draconian and authoritarian practices in uh, Indian legislation. So let's have a look at um, Aligar. Right, the next film I'm going to talk about is very different in tone and tenor. It features two young children in an, a remote village on the border with Bangladesh. One of the boys is Hindu, and the other boy, his closest friend, is Muslim. And it delves into these elements of sectarian division and strife that have ex existed for a really long time in India. But it does so through uh, the eyes of children, through this coming of age story, the loss of innocence. And it captures it very evocatively, aesthetically, through this uh, the landscape that is interwoven into this coming-of-age story, the journeys that these two children go through as they kind of just engage in playful delights that, that are ostensibly innocent. But by the end of the film, there is that kind of degradation or erosion of innocence as a result of religious 
division. So let's have a look at this film, though, Suji. I'm pleased to say we managed to screen it at the UK Asian Film Festival and it received an award as well, uh, justifiably so, because it's one of the most beautiful pieces of cinema I've seen emerge from India in recent years. Let's have a look. And the last example of an indie uh, I'd like to play for you is a very recent film that um, I'm pleased to say doing really well in India and across the world. So this is a film we screened at the festival this year and it's called Adieu Godard, which is in some sense an homage to, to Godard, which is very timely as well, uh, considering the director's recent demise. So it's a film made by a Bengali director called Omartya Bhattacharya and uh, in the film, a group, a motley assortment of villagers in a, in a small village in Odisha, they um, kind of, they usually get together to watch pornographic films. But during the process, an elderly member of that group discovers the films of Jean-Luc Godard, and as a result, is captivated by the wonderful world of films and decides to start a film festival in the village with disastrous consequences, but very kind of, uh, hilarious consequences as well. It's a film that is an amalgamation of different um, elements of form, style, but ultimately uh, very powerful in its rendition of political undercurrents in contemporary India. And it uses a very unique capsule to derate uh, some of these troublesome, tumultuous dimensions of contemporary Indian politics. It's a film that I would thoroughly endorse uh, you watching if you can, if you get an opportunity to watch uh, A Dear God Out. Please do watch this film. So I'm going to play again the promo from that film, which again maybe condenses what I've just said. So you can see the Nouvelle Vague inspired influences in the in in the aesthetic of the film, but the the actual themes and content are very tethered to an Indian rural landscape. Again, the local element of the, <laughs> of the Indies. So I'm just going to end by citing some of the challenges that face the uh, Indies, some of the existential challenges even. Uh, censorship poses a real stumbling block for independent films with often controversial content. And the rise of authoritarian uh, proto-fascist populist politics under Narendra Modi's BJP government constitutes this ex existential threat. Uh, government intervention through super censor laws which have been passed recently, which also, for example, the draft cinematograph um, amendment act uh, gives power to the government to revoke certificates given to films to, to be screened in cinemas. So effectively, the government can revoke these screening certificates and pull uh, films that have been released back into their ambit of censorship. The same is uh, can be said about recent IT laws, uh, regulations that have been passed, uh, drawing web streaming platforms that were up to this point relatively free of censorship. So Amazon Prime and Netflix films up there on those portals are also now within the state's uh, censorship control. So these are some disconcerting dimensions that have transpired over the last couple of years which uh, causes one to think what the future of the new independent Indian films will be. But my confidence in, in presenting a more optimistic scenario is that the Indies will kind of have to think outside of the box to circumvent some of these restrictions and perhaps will therefore be even more inventive and innovative. So I'm gonna end on that note with 10 years later, these are some of the films that continue to push the boundaries, continue to kind of challenge dominant systems, the status quo, the ruling establishment. Films like Love, The Great Indian Kitchen, a uh, brilliant film from Kerala, Sherni, a film about the environment, Aji, which is a film, uh, again, I would thoroughly recommend. Uh, the actress in the film, Aji, Sushma Deshpande, is going to be in a short film that's going to be screened today as well, My Mother's Girlfriend. So I would thoroughly recommend watching both those films. Dosaji, Jai Beam, Pig, a whole host. There are too many to name. So I hope we'll be able to talk a bit more about some of these films. Uh, and I'm going to end on that note. But if you'd like to know more about the book, there are a few flyers out in the foyer. Please do help yourself to uh, a flyer. It gives you a bit more information about um, the latest book. I'll end on that note. Thank you. I, I think you got my question so far. Uh, we just slipped through the answer. <laughs> okay, uh, I understand. Okay, I got through the, at the end of, uh, at your book is a list of uh, films which have been produced in, uh, in 2010. Oh, we, 
sh um, screened about uh, 50, 60 percent of all the films uh, that were listed, but in about 20, 20 or 21, uh, we sometimes it's only one film. I got the impression the number of films released increased dramatically, positively speaking, spoken. Absolutely. So I tried my best to enlist some of the essential indies, as I call them, at the, towards the end of the book. But that was a huge challenge as well to literally be as representative of the sheer volume of films that have emerged from uh, across you know, the various regions in India. So it's not just, f films are emerging, independent films from all four corners of the country. And uh, yeah, as I was saying, I, I can testify to this by the number of film submissions we receive at the UK Asian Film Festival, uh, which over the last five years have, you know, the number of films has, has really grown in number. So it's definitely uh, the, a fact that new independent Indian films are here to stay. So it's, it has become really a genre in its own right. Uh, we try to open the discussion as soon as possible to the audience. So if you want to uh, put a question to Oshwin already, okay, I come with the microphone to you. No, no, it has to be recorded, we, otherwise uh, it lasts forever. We, uh, and so you can speak in the microphone. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, to get to know you despite all the lockdown and the difficult times in Europe. I have a question. Uh, have you ever thought of going to Berlin? Ever, Petra? Why I think the Indies film is so groundbreaking. What are the chances of coming to Berlin? Or what are, I don't know what hurdles you have or to other cities in, in Germany? Um, there is an Indian film festival in Berlin and uh, Indo-German Film Week um, about, uh, since 10 years around. Uh. Partly, the, um, um, okay. I, I can pick up from uh, on that question by just saying that often there are, uh, there's a handful of films that make it to the Berlinale, but, th but that, that just tends to be a minuscule number of films, and therefore that needs to change, I think. There have been some path-breaking films like uh, Jayan Cherian's Papilio Buddha, which was you know, released in 2013, I think, if I'm not mistaken, which was denied a certificate of release in India because of its controversial content, but then was screened in Berlin. But I think there is a rich opportunity for film curators at some of these more dominant Western um, arenas to showcase uh, a more representative spectrum of uh, new independent Indian films. I, I think I would argue that there is a modicum of a tokenization in some of these film festivals that have, as I say, been dominated by a Western consciousness. And I think kind of devolving from that into film festivals, uh, such as new generations, which are doing great work, you know, in terms of showcasing these films. I think that we need a kind of growth and infrastructural development to make these uh, arenas of showcasing independent films from South Asia more prominent, uh, also more kind of linked up and joined up. So that's where the South Asian Film Festivals Federation that we initiated uh, was underpinned by an ethos to form a kind of um, connectivity between uh, South Asian film festival curatorship across the world. How do, um, you, you already mentioned that all these independent filmmakers um, face more and more difficulties regarding censorship and the politi political difficulties. How do they cope with that? They don't cope very well because often these systems can be all-encompassing and it's very difficult for a filmmaker to battle against the odds of denial of a certificate of release. For example, a film like Lipstick Under My Burka was denied a certificate of release on the basis that it was too female-oriented. Now, how do you confront such a, uh, you know, ridiculous proposition? But I'm pleased to say, eventually, Alankrita Srivastava uh, was able to take 
her argument to uh, a court of uh, appeal, which existed but has been uh, now abolished by the Indian government. It used to be called the Film Certificate uh, uh, Appellate Tribunal, uh, Tribunal uh, FCAT, but they've done away with that now, so there is no last course of uh, appeal for um, filmmakers. So as I say, it's quite a uh, discouraging dimension as we speak of things, but filmmakers have looked increasingly to web streaming platforms to get their films, you know, uh, circumvent the, the, the standard kind of convention of um, gaining a certificate of release, which is mandatory in India. So every filmmaker has to gain a certificate of release from the Indian Censor Board. And that's when a film can be exhibited in a public space, in, in a cinema, or, or in film festivals. But a lot of filmmakers are kind of just, you know, looking at the digital domain in order to get their films out. Uh, a good example is the film Gandu, which I mentioned, which found its way onto YouTube. It was illegally uploaded, but gained about five million viewers. <laughs> so this, you know, uh, led to questioning the efficacy of censorship. But as I've said, uh, the, the new IT laws bring streaming platforms and web content into the domain of censorship. So we'll need to really watch this space to see how independent filmmakers have to you know, think tangentially or outside of the box in order to kind of develop new strategies. I think uh, filmmakers continue to challenge through their films uh, some of these authoritarian norms. A good film example is Jai Beam. A lot of these films are coming from the south in India, especially in Kerala, Tamil Nadu, uh, films that are still pushing the envelope in terms of uh, representation. Jai Beam is a film that's very vocal, and I, I would recommend watching that film because there's a, 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 a courtroom sequence where the lawyer really challenges some of the uh, problematic political policies that uh, the, the BJP government have enacted, but done in within the film's diegetic world, uh, they've done it in a very tactful way that it just comes across as you know courtroom drama. But we all know the viewers know that it is based on fact. So I think these are some of the strategies that are going to have to be deployed uh, innovatively by independent filmmakers. Uh, Ashwin, how important do you think uh, the Indian diaspora, which is very large uh, and fairly powerful across the world, how important uh, the Indian diaspora is in actually supporting this uh, movement of independent uh, Indian films? And uh, it's also a two-way sword, isn't it? Because there is a section of this diaspora who wouldn't um, like too much the kind of content which is shown, they would like a very rosy picture of India and not the reality that is India. On the other hand, there are many young people and also maybe a little older people uh, who would be very supportive because they are so out of touch with what is happening in contemporary India. So your thoughts on that? I think it's a very important, very pertinent question. It's off the moment in relation to incidents that have transpired in, in Leicester. Uh, some of you may be aware of tensions between diasporic Hindu and Muslim communities that um, have really been um, very turbulent in, in the sense of, uh, uh, this has been a paradigm shift in terms of cultural relations between the communities, diasporic communities from South Asia in the UK, which up to this point have been amicable, harmonious, but we've seen a real rift in that sense. So where cinema does come in is, in terms of, for example, I can speak from the perspective of the UK Asian F Film Festival, where we reiterate our commitment to bringing South Asian cinemas together and South Asian communities. So we speak for uh, all of these communities rather than being an India-centric film festival. And your point is absolutely right in terms of the role that's, that the diasp uh, diasporic communities play in relation to politics. And often there is this theme of long-distance nationalism, which occurs within you know, the United States and Britain, uh, Australia, and so on. So I think um, a good example is where there are films like um, the Kashmir Files, which are you know, thinly veiled propaganda for the Modi government, which have been propagated uh, unilaterally by the government across these regions, catering to or targeted at the Indian diaspora. Uh, trying to kind of rope them into this problematic ideology. But the counter-narrative to that often functions through film festivals and what they program. So I think film festivals have a duty of care in their programming to actually uh, advocate for films that re are reflective of or reveal, expose some of these 
troublesome dimensions. A film like Dostoji is a film that, for me, is a film that speaks to the history of sectarian violence, but also talks about the possibility of har harmonious coexistence. So I think curation plays a very important role, but also education in terms of beckoning to young uh, members of the diaspora and alerting to them to films that are radical in their consciousness, but also challenge some of these oppressive systems. So it's a juxtaposition for me of education of um, innovative and thoughtful curatorship and arenas of exhibition. So um, we do a lot of outreach and community-based work in uh, the UK through the UK Asian Film Festival. So it's not restricted to just screening films, but also going out into communities, involving them, talking to them, co-creating with them. For example, we created um, a project called Memories Through Cinema, uh, and I directed a film called Movies, Memories, Magic, which uh, captured the oral histories of all members of the South Asian uh, diaspora, where they went to watch films, what kind of films they were watching, uh, harmonious co community events, and so on, and presented a forum for everyone to come together and talk about their antecedents, their, the, their own histories, and how we could uh, kind of uh, formulate lines of intersection, community conversations, and so on. So I think these are some of the practical strategies we can work through in order to kind of offset some of the more divisive dimensions of, uh, you know, that, that stem from nationalistic or uh, ultra-religious ideologies. So to the point that you just uh, said about uh, the, uh, the duty of care, I was wondering, um, you know, what are your thoughts about like, when all these multiplexes, they kind of control um, all the first-run theaters and everything. Um, what you said is so important. Uh, so how do, you, how do you envision independent films kind of competing with these first-run theaters and uh, just the, the big multiplexes and everything, either in India or, or here? I mean, I, I, I think your point about the film festivals is very, very important there. So, Thank you. It's a, it's a great question. I think it's a David versus Goliath struggle. But uh, there's also been a paradigm shift. Uh, I don't know if you read in the news that Bollywood is facing a decline because of, A, the rise of southern uh, regional films, but also uh, the shift to uh, the online space, digital streaming platforms, where people are becoming more and more inclined to just sit at home and watch these films or consume cinema uh, from the online space rather than going out to watch big Bollywood extravaganzas. So for me, this is a very important shift of gears. Uh, primarily because um, from a film curation perspective, it's about working synergistically with digital streaming platforms. And that's become one of the methodologies that we've had to deploy where film curatorship is no longer just about isolated once a year events, uh, but also working with you know, technology in terms of presenting the films we curate online, making them accessible to wider audiences and so on. So there's ostensibly, it seems, the decline of the multiplex as the bastion, especially within India, which control the discourse in terms of what or shaping views of um, you know, uh, how people view film, society, culture, and so on, especially through the lens of Bollywood. So we're witnessing a key change here. And I think the online space will continue to kind of amplify its presence. And therefore, I think uh, up to this point, the Indian Indies have made their mark on Netflix and Amazon Prime. You can find a huge catalog of indie films on these portals. So I teach a course on new independent Indian cinema. And I used to struggle in the early days in 2016 to kind of find DVDs to pass on to my students. But these days, all of the films are on these online streaming platforms. So I think that's where I see a positive, despite the kind of corporate echelons of how these you know, organizations, Netflix and Amazon Prime are run. The paradox is we can actually harness them to you know, create an alternative space for some of these films. Good example is a film called Life of an Outcast, which is a really low budget film in rural India, which is about the Dalit, you know, so-called lower caste uh, lived experience of persecution on a daily basis. So these are the films that are globally ac accessible on Netflix. So I would say it's indie filmmakers trying to utilize that online platform to kind of you know, express or articulate these narratives of dissent and interrogation. Um, I have to play a very unpleasant role. We are here for just one hour, and this hour is nearly over. And um, 
thankfully, Deutsche Filmmuseum gave us the opportunity to be here, which we really appreciate. I would like to suggest to continue the discussion with you or the conversation with you in the cafe upstairs because we have to uh, speed to the cinema. The next show with you starts uh, with our guest, starts at four o'clock and it's all already 3.30. So, Ashwin, thank you very much. It was great and I'm very sorry to interrupt this very interesting discussion. So, thanks for coming and come to the um, film festival just in harmony. Uh, it's not far. If you speed up, you will be there at four o'clock straight. So thank you for coming. Thanks very much.